Enigma depravatio est. Enigma cruderitas est. So let's start from Genesis. At the beginning, yes. <laughs> right at the very beginning, yeah. We're going to go back into Exodus and, and uh, the story of Adam and Eve. And it might seem an obvious place to start in, in the Bible, but of course, nobody ever starts there in, in terms of looking for a historical facts within the Bible because it's so otherworldly, it's so nebulous. I mean, how can you find real history within the Old Testament? The Bible begins and ends with enigmatic books. <laughs> yes, it does rather, yeah. I haven't got into uh, Revelations yet, but maybe one day. I've, I've had a few snippets from Revelations, enough to show me that there is information there that could be interesting. But uh, yeah, likewise, um, Genesis, it's all a bit nebulous. And so it wasn't the first thing I tackled. I came back to it later, after I had been looking at the Amarna period, the um, era of Pharaoh Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Because it was after I had written all the books about Akhenaten that I suddenly realized that if you look at Genesis, it's an awful lot like the hymn to the Aten, the great hymn that was written by Akhenaten himself, apparently. Although actually extracts of it are very ancient because um, Amenhotep III had a very, very similar hymn. So this is an ancient hymn that goes back beyond Akhenaten. And it just seems to me that this is, uh, the Genesis story is actually a copy of the hymn to the art. And before we go on to that, perhaps we should go back to why we're thinking about Genesis story being in Egypt in the first place. Because everybody says, this is the general opinion of everybody, that it was to do with Sumer, Mesopotamia. It was between the Euphrates and the Tigris. But that's not actually what the Old Testament says. What Genesis says is, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became four branches. Genesis 2.10. There is only one river in that area, in the whole of that region, that does that. A river that runs through a garden and then is parted into four branches. It's the River Nile. It's the only river that splits as it comes up to the Nile Delta, and it used to split into four branches it doesn't anymore it splits into two nowadays but it used to split into four so we should be talking about egypt here and of course the references we have in the english bible to euphrates are, are not actually correct it doesn't actually say that it actually says um, the parath which doesn't translate directly into euphrates it's just been assumed that it will be the euphrates so already we've taken this epic story and we've put it back into Egypt which is where it should belong. Authors like Ralph Ellis, Ryan Forster, and Graham Hancock make us question the current theories on civilization, so I was inspired by them to challenge the current theory on the Garden of Eden as a Catholic, but also as someone with a master's in landscape architecture who has studied some anthropology. What sparked my curiosity originally was the painting above in the Catholic church I was attending. The Trinity symbol, representing the three natures of God as a divine architect, kept reminding me of Egypt, so I asked myself, could Egypt be the true source of civilization? The current theory by Dr. Jura Sarines, I believe his logic is flawed from the start, and Dr. Ward Sanford is just piggybacking off of Dr. Zarines, whose theory is more logical than Sanford's. And Dr. Francesca Stavalakopoulos theory that it is simply in Jerusalem diverts a little too much away from the Bible. But Zarines and Stanford's theory both fails to take into consideration of the phenomenon of cross-pollination of civilization and recycling. Both actually take the Genesis story too literal, where Dr. Francesca may not take it literal enough. 
So I would be skeptical of these professors taking up this legend and make it sound scientific and then people just latching on to a theory because, oh, well, they're professors, so we can believe it now. But if their logic is flawed from the start, then theory could be out the window. That doesn't mean to say that some of their logic is sound. We need to take the best from each researcher and other researchers who may not be professors, but take their ideas to come up with the most logical conclusion. First, let's address cross-pollination presented by YouTuber Ancient Astronaut Arguments. Now, I'm not a proponent of the theory of ancient astronauts, but he does do his research in mythologies, and this gives you an idea of how intertwined Samaria and Egypt really were. Prior to the creation of dynasties in the prehistory of ancient Egypt, god kings reigned. These beings were undoubtedly the same Anunnaki of the ancient Sumerian text, but with different names. For example, Ptah of Egypt is the Sumerian Inki, Isis the same as Inanna, and Ra the same as Marduk. But Egypt was distinct from Sumer, even if the players were essentially the same. In Egypt, Ptah slash Inki held sway, while in Sumer, it was his half-brother Enlil, this is a major difference and accounts for massive differences in their histories, cultures, and those traditions brought down to us today. Osiris had begun his reign of Lower Egypt circa 7,220 BCE and continued for some 450 years. Seth, who by the way was never shown without his animal disguise, had begun his reign of Upper Egypt circa 6,870 BCE and lasted for some 350 years. The meaning of Seth's name, incidentally, still defies Egyptologists, despite the name being identical to Adam and Eve's third son. It should also be noted that the seven gods from Ptah to Ra to Horus reigned a total of 12,300 years. Horus took over the reigns of kingship circa 6,420 BCE and held sway for about 300 years. He was followed by 12 divine rulers, or gods, including Thoth and Mot, who ruled for a total of 1,570 years. They were followed in turn by 38 demigods, who ruled for some 3,650 years, beginning circa 4,550 BCE. The Turin Papyrus, from the time of Ramses II, lists Ra, Geb, Osiris, Seth, and Horus as the kings of Egypt, and later Thoth and Mott and others. We can't rule out the possibility that the Jews and the Sumerians were greatly influenced by Egyptian legends. For in the Genesis story, we also see this idea that the characters were living for hundreds of years, just as the Egyptian gods. So are the characters in the Genesis story really humans or anthropomorphized supernatural creatures that took human form? I think the Genesis story is a fusion of basic human origin story as well as an actual supernatural event that may have transpired in a very specific location. For now, let's put the supernatural aside and focus on the idea of a garden. In the documentary, The Hunt for the Garden of Eden, which is promoting Dr. Zarin's theory, also points out a flaw in his theory. Genesis 2-3, to the famous story, has some verses in verses 10 to 14, where a river is said to come out of the Garden of Eden, and it becomes four headwaters. And the rivers in question are Tigris and Euphrates, and we all know where they are. They're the major rivers of Mesopotamia, the modern Iraq. The other two rivers are called the Pishon and the Gihon. Unlike the Tigris and the Euphrates, which still flow today, no one knew where these other two rivers once ran or if they ever really existed. It appears these two rivers have always been quite obscure, even in biblical times. In fact, the first known mention of them is the Bible itself. Quite a bit more is said about those two rivers in the text, which probably implies that the ancient Hebrews too, though those rivers were a bit more unknown and mysterious, so required a bit of elaboration. The Pishon, is said to encompass a mineral-rich land called Havilah, and the Gihon is said to flow through a land called Cush. Some versions of the Bible translate Cush as Ethiopia. 
Locating these two rivers and where they joined with the Tigris and Euphrates to form the famous Four Headwaters was the key to unlocking the mystery of Eden's position. Find the rivers, and Zarin's would find Eden. What happens is it just says there were four rivers, and they made one river, and that's where the garden is. I mean, if everybody knew where the four rivers was, the, the, you know, the biblical scholars would have solved this question years ago. The location of the Pishon and the Gihon has baffled scholars for centuries. Many medieval thinkers thought the Pishon might be the river Ganges, India's holiest river. As for the Gihon, even today, most biblical scholars believe that it refers to the river Nile. Now, the text says, the river Gihon flows around the whole land of Cush. And Cush, everywhere else in the Old Testament, means Nubia or the Sudan. And Jewish tradition was very strongly convinced of that over many centuries. It didn't deviate. And the fact that it goes all the way around the land of Cush, which is named for Sudan, south of Egypt, you know, the, the Nile is the only important river there. But that interpretation presented a serious problem. The Nile isn't anywhere near the Tigris or the Euphrates. So there is no place on Earth where it could join with them and the Pishon to form the all-important four headwaters. The location of the Garden of Eden. So to me, this is a very important hint that Dr. Zarin's is ignoring. He'd rather stay on the safe side and take the Bible more literal instead of having more anthropological understanding. He wants to avoid contradictions, which might create controversy in turn affecting his reputation. And since he's on a documentary, it would be in his interest to stay on the safe side and simplify his hypothesis for the sake of attracting a certain audience. If you study up on Dr. Michael Heiser's research, you will learn that cultures will take stories to fit their political and geographic location to create a new identity. But that does not mean that the original story came from those authors. For example, the story of Lion King was originally inspired by the Japanese story of Kimba, the White Lion. Or the story of Disney's Atlantis being inspired by Gainax Studios' Nadia's Secrets of Blue Water, even though they may not want to admit it because it might not be in their political interests. And so too, this may not be in the political interests of the Jews at the times. So there was a lot of animosity with the Egyptians. Keep in mind the Jews were Egyptian citizens for hundreds of years, if not thousands, until they broke away, and so too other tribes may have broken away such as the Phoenicians, maybe the Minoans, and possibly even the Sumerians. The way we date cultures may be wrong due to too much overlap and recycling of materials. So stories will be changed to fit the land and political perspective of that culture due to political factions breaking off from a mother culture. For example, the colonies in America broke breaking away from the British to form a new identity. Also, other cultures will adopt the same name or come up with a new name. For example, the land of Kush can also be a reference to the mountains in Iran, but logically it doesn't fit to this idea of the Bible referencing rivers. So we would have to avoid that specific use of the name in that region to fitting a more logical conclusion that it has something to do with rivers. Also, when we say the Garden of Eden, is Eden the name of the garden, or is it the larger place that the garden is located in? I would argue that Eden could be referencing Africa at the time, and the garden is the delta which has small rivers that branch off. So the Bible is simply the latest cross-pollination inspiration of a potentially older story. And there is another hint to keep in mind. Yuristarin's views, I think, uh, have multiple problems attached to them. The first is that the rivers Tigris and Euphrates flow down from the mountains of Armenia into the Persian Gulf area. Genesis 2 says the rivers flow out of Eden and become four headwaters. So that implies they are going from a higher area down to the Persian Gulf area. And so I think he's located the Garden of Eden at the wrong end. Even the ancient Hebrews knew that rivers don't flow upwards. So if the rivers are flowing out of Eden, and if Eden is, as Ralph Ellison puts it, a reference to the Aten, or the sun god, symbolizing the most powerful hidden one, or supernatural being, aka God, then one way to look at this is the Aten 
resides in the wilderness where the sun rises and sets, where only the gods can survive. So if Eden is the deserts of Africa, then the garden is the Nile River and the Delta. If Genesis is hinting that the river flows from south to north, out of a larger place called Eden, then the Nile River is the only large river that flows out of Eden to water the garden, which is the Nile Delta, the largest agricultural oasis in the whole Middle East for the past 15,000 years or more. It was these ancient people who first used the word Eden. It's a very, very ancient word, uh, which the Sumerians used in, in a very ancient way, uh, and it means a land of steppes or grasslands uh, where people live kind of wild, where animals are wild. The Sumerians used the term Eden to refer to uncultivated areas beyond their territory. In other words, the sort of place where nature was not controlled by man, but by God. If this word, Eden, came from Mesopotamia, then it seemed logical that the Garden of Eden was located there. This idea was supported by the fact that many early Bible stories have Mesopotamian roots. But that logic is assuming that the word was not inspired by an older source. And notice how they're trying to imply that Eden is the garden. But this is not what Eden is, as they explain in the clip. But they're trying to show footage of vegetative lands, which I might add is not suitable for agriculture, mass production at least. The origins of the idea of a garden has always been referencing agriculture. Eden is lands without defined borders that's not controlled by any one culture or city-state. It is a land that is not agriculturally suitable, so it is the wild or uncontrolled. Now I understand that Genesis is hinting that the garden was a natural place made by God, and yes, the Nile Delta fits this idea, because it has always been the most suitable land for cultivation in the, in the whole Middle East. So God has given man dominion over this land. Sure, there's other agricultural pockets scattered throughout the Middle East, such as in Israel, but the space is not as defined as the Nile Delta. One aspect of the idea of a garden is to have a defined space. The Sumerians and Jews may have been the last culture to pass down the story through their political perspective. Sumerians might have been the first place where the city-state emerged with agricultural land around it, but the place that had the largest agricultural land and largest population was Egypt, or the land of Kemet, referencing the Nile Delta. Egypt didn't need the concept of the city-state with closed walls. Instead, the Nile Delta has always been a defined space juxtaposed between two deserts on each side and a sea to the north and an entrance to the south of the delta where the Nile parts into small rivers to water the garden. Egypt's Nile Delta is like a garden city with small villages and temple complexes scattered throughout the delta such as at Tanis. The delta hosted the largest population region in the whole Middle East for thousands of years because of its unique environmental determinisms that would inevitably form a civilization more quickly than in Mesopotamia, making it a very geopolitically valued region. I think there's this misconception that the Fertile Crescent is fertile. Throughout the 20th century, canals were being made between the Tigris and Euphrates, but still they're not able to make that space between Iraq near Baghdad completely vegetative, unlike the Nile Delta, due to its topography difference and lower rates of silt deposit and river spacing. What you see now is hundreds of years of irrigation to make this region between the Tigris and Euphrates vegetative. Even so, the density of the vegetation is lower than that of the Nile Delta. The average temperature is also higher due to it being not situated next to the Persian Gulf. So thousands of years ago, this was actually more desolate and the vegetative buffer only went out about a kilometer or so, unlike the Nile Delta. But the documentary will have you believe that the Middle East was lush at the end of the Ice Age. It was an Ice Age river. All of, all of Arabia was drained by three huge rivers in the Ice Age. And gradually, in what we call the Neolithic period, they dried up and they weren't as extensive. And so when they connected up, obviously the landscape was different. And so now you have to figure out when that was. The answer is about five, 6,000 BC. This element of timing is important for two reasons. First, 
Back when this river was still flowing, the region of the Persian Gulf looked quite different to how it does today. In fact, at that time, there was no Persian Gulf. It was dry land. The Gulf is, uh, and during the last ice age, it was completely dry land because sea level fell about 200 feet, and the, and the deepest part of, of the Gulf is 120 feet. You'll figure it out. <laughs> it's all dry. No, it wasn't all dry land, unless you're talking about over 50,000 years ago or more. Here's an approximation map by Dr. Jeffrey Rose, an archaeologist showing the stages of when the Persian Gulf was filled over a long period of time. Even 13,000 years ago, the Gulf was almost completely filled. It was a salty marshland with dry air and the occasional monsoon that kept it alive. This was not prime real estate for agriculture. The region between the Tigris and Euphrates would have been more suitable, but not as suitable as the Nile Delta. According to Dr. Jeffrey Rose, it was over 100,000 years ago when Arabia was more like Ethiopia's climate today. But we're not talking about a legend that's over 20,000 years old. Dr. Zarens is using the argument that this is just an allegory of hunter and gatherer people, but we're talking about an epic with a fusion of a creation story along with a pre-dynastic story, according to Dr. Michael Heiser's biblical research. I think over thousands of years the Jews have turned what was once about the first kingdom to an oversimplification of a creation story uh, through a nomadic lifestyle perspective. Reality is it's most likely a fusion of both. It's not a story of man just living in paradise without agriculture, it's a story of the discovery of agriculture and the birth of civilization that creates a paradise. The mass production of food and building of settlements and a kingdom, that is what it means to create a paradise or a garden. The discovery of agriculture is not the original sin, according to Dr. Michael Heiser, who states there is a supernatural worldview you have to have to understand that there might have been some strange event that happened in a very particular place in time, which is reflected in other mythologies, where the gods are the ones that sinned along with man, the sin of magic, in which Egypt is well known for. It's a more complicated legend that's been oversimplified for children to understand. I think most of the Genesis story is a fragmentation of a catastrophe along with a strange supernatural event. Eight thousand years ago, the climate of the region was totally different. At that time, monsoon rains, which today only reach the southernmost tip of Arabia, would have covered the whole peninsula with life-giving rain. It was this rain that fed the Pishon, allowing it to flow all year round. More importantly, the land around the river would not have been a harsh desert. It would have been lush and green. This is why the Sumerians thought of Dilmun as the birthplace of humanity, because it was a paradise. The land of Eden. It would have been a steppe land with lots of little oases, marshlands, just like southern Iraq was to many people for a long time after that. It's a beautiful area. You got, lot, you got water, you got resources, you got mud, you can build houses, you got reeds, animals, plants, you got it all. No, you don't. The typology was different. What Dr. Zarens is referring to is the period between 8000 BC and 5000 BC, which doesn't match up to the period when the Persian Gulf was actually dry land. Yes, there was more rain, but it was monsoon rain from the Indian Ocean that only went up about halfway up Arabia. It was not stable jet stream rain like you get in North America. Without abundant amounts of vegetative material building up soil for thousands of years prior to 8000 BC, you're not going to have a lush landscape suitable for agriculture. Now, I don't know what their definition of paradise is, but it sure isn't what you see in the paintings. The landscape would have been more of a savanna, with scattered salt, marshlands, and oases, and shrublands for a few thousand years, which is not suitable for agriculture, let alone a tropical paradise. The period he was referring to on the graph is at the 8,200 year cooling period, but that is dwarfed compared to the Younger Dryas cooling period. What caused the cooling and increase of precipitation around 6000 BC is most likely volcanic eruptions such as at Mount Etna causing disturbance in the monsoon patterns. Many of the smaller blips on the graph you see are due to volcanic eruptions such as the Little Ice Age. So Dr. Zarens is kind of ignoring the elephant in the room. Something really devastating happened around 14,000 years ago causing the final blow of the megafauna extinction event. Keep in mind, before 11,000 BC, the whole Middle East was still a desert of different types, which would have been cooler on average than today. 
Think of the Gobi Desert mixed with savanna. So the closest thing to a paradise in the Middle East was the Nile Delta. The White Nile system in the Ba el Arab and the White Nile rifts remained a closed lake until the connection of the Victoria Nile to the main system some 12,500 years ago. The Nile Delta would have been larger at the time when sea levels were gradually rising at the end of the Ice Age. It wasn't the gradual rise of sea levels that inspired the Great Flood. It was a catastrophe of some sort, like a rain of Tunguska meteor airbursts causing tsunamis and climactic changes, as author Randall Carlson hypothesizes. Also, the melting of glacial waters around the Caucasus and the mountains of Turkey would have brought cold, sandy waters to the Tigris and Euphrates at the time. It was not a stable river system. It lacked abundant amounts of silt for vegetation to take hold. It would have only had a narrow vegetative buffer, but its delta never formed to be a lush garden. The Nile rivers, which got its waters from the watersheds around Lake Victoria, gave life-giving soil, making Egypt the land of Kemet or the black soil. If Gobekli Tepe hints that megalithic culture could be far older, then I would hypothesize that that culture came from a garden like the Nile Delta, which had the resources and defined space to spark a civilization. For all we know, Noah could have been an Egyptian royal preparing his people for an evacuation for those that trusted him. A natural disaster could have been a combination of more than one type, such as tsunamis and abnormal monsoons that were altered by the meteor storm. Genesis could be a telling of one major event in a period of a few years which was fragmented into smaller stories as cultures broke away from Egypt, after the deluge. If there's any culture that can produce an arc, it would have been the pre-dynastic Egyptians if Egypt really is an older culture and the mother culture of the whole Middle East. The arc would have looked something more like this. Noah and his family may have gathered livestock and citizens who believed that the storm was coming. There may have been major political disputes on what to do to prepare for this disaster. And Noah may have been the only political leader to propose an ark, and the rest just either flee by foot or took smaller boats. I might also point out there's some unusual depressions off the coast of the Nile Delta fan with six in a row. Currently this is simply dismissed as geological depressions. It's not picked up on Google Earth, but it is picked up on USGS. This might be something to look into more deeply. Since the 1990s, they've discovered megalithic ruins off the coast of Alexandria, Egypt. This could just be a small sample of what could be off the coast of the Nile Delta fan, so I would urge archaeologists to stop looking for megalithic ruins south of the delta, but to look in the delta and off the coast, buried under 10 feet of silt, could be megalithic ruins waiting to be discovered.